Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, kind guests, my friends, I would like to start my speech by thanking you, all of you, for your presence here today. It looks like yesterday, but it's already passed one year since, uh, thanks to the Japanese government foresight, it has been given new impetus to such an important project like the one related to the need to address at the G7 level the key issues related to the impact that uh, the digital revolution is having on the entire society, on citizens, on businesses. We all know that uh, within a few years there will be a progressive uh, connection to the ultra broadband network of thousands and thousands of objects today unconnected. The diffusion of next generation fixed and mobile convergent networks will play a key role in this scenario, enabling in a fully connected and inclusive society a multiplicity of services that can be used simultaneously. Digital is really an extraordinary opportunity. In this context, the impossibility to access internet can be the main factor of social exclusion in the near future. Here it comes the political dimension that is able to solve such problems. And the political dimension first refers to the responsibility of the richest and most developed countries. But, uh, the challenge today coming out from the digital revolution is not just related to the connectivity concept. Access, in fact, is just a part of the picture. The big challenge is to drive the process of technological development, which is now running at the speed of light, keeping the human being protagonist and at the center of the scene. This, really this, is the challenge for our countries, for our governments, and more for our democracies. Let's think all together, for example, about the still and imaginable impact that the development of artificial intelligence the full realization of the Internet of Things, the massive use of nanotechnologies, or the development of the 5G can guarantee to citizens and businesses. Then, the key objective that you must pursue is to work together to develop a fully inclusive digital information society. The new information and communication technologies today are able to ensure a sustainable global growth, the spreading of stability, the digital inclusion for all the citizens, and the development of the entrepreneurial layer while respecting the environment. In this regard, the importance of the G7 ministers' meetings as well as uh, the connected events, such as this multi-stakeholder conference, is tied to the opportunity to share and coordinate together all the possible actions to unlock the potential of the new technology at a global level. Citizens and businesses need to be able to connect to the network and become part of the digital society which must not, therefore, be a landmark of a few, but of all. Italy is fully committed to doing its part, and in the last two and a half years has adopted regulatory and technical tools to stimulate the country's alignment 
with the international trend of growth in the digital sector. I remember, for example, the strategy for ultra broadband, the strategy Industry 4.0, the strategy for the digitization of services and the initiatives to spread free Wi-Fi connectivity and to build 5G infrastructures and services. All these initiatives have a unique target to make citizens and firms in the right conditions to participate at global level to the digital revolution. In this regard, we have to work together. We have to start from collaboration to affirm the realization of a society where freedom of citizens to move on the territory is followed by the freedom to market with uniform rules, as well as the freedom to enjoy services and content regardless of where we are located, which media we are using, and at what time we connect. A true ubiquitous society accessible and open to all. We must therefore continue to invest a lot cooperating each other for the development of ultra broadband infrastructures, the digitization of both the public and private sectors, the implementation of concepts like smart cities, smart regions, smart countries, digital tourism, and industry 4.0. This ensures that uh, the diffusion of pervasive fixed and mobile technologies as well as the next generation services continue with a long-term view whose aim is to create, to create a society based on the digital inclusion of all citizens and on the economic growth. This multi-stakeholder conference, which will cover the themes related uh, to the small and medium enterprises, the digital transformation, the free circulation of data, the security in cyberspace, and in general, the digital society, will have the important task of, of providing uh, important information to the minister during the meetings that will be held tonight and tomorrow morning. So, I wish you a good job. Diego Piacentini, Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, Italian Prime Minister's Office, is invited to take the floor. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm actually going to um, unveil what is happening with the parallel work called the I-7. I-7 is the Innovation 7. And uh, what is exactly the I-7? First of all, I'd like to characterize the I-7 as an experiment. It's uh, um, patronized, and actually it's an idea of the Italian uh, Council of President, Minister's Office, and uh, it's about asking a group of experts, uh, non-governmental experts, experts coming from the industries, to give, uh, after discussion, an opinion on what's happening with artificial intelligence, big data, and the effects on potential policy-making activity. So the I-7 is actually gathering at the same time in, uh, in, uh, in a few rooms uh, in the same office. And uh, it's uh, going to discuss actions that usually cannot just be dealt with at the one country level, but obviously can be uh, achieved through solutions at the multiple country levels. The I-7 will generate ideas and practical suggestions, both short-term and long-term visions and governments will decide if and how to make use of them. Um, it's about 38 experts 
which are discussing about three what we believe to be fundamental questions. Question number one is how can help, uh, uh, artificial intelligence help governments make better decisions and deliver policies and services more effectively? So we're not just discussing about artificial intelligence in general, but it's going to be a focused discussion on how AI can actually help governments make better decisions. What's the background of this question? AI represents one of the most intriguing and promising fields of innovation and obviously has uh, the potential to dramatically improve the way public and private services are delivered. So our point is that government should not be looked only as a regulator of artificial intelligence, but also as a user and the big pusher of artificial intelligence technology. Indeed, artificial intelligence has, already in some cases, plenty of applications in government. As an example, NLU, natural language understanding, technology can help improve service for citizens, sees as customers. That's just one of the many potential applications. Um, anything that can be forming what's the buzzword smart city is about AI from traffic management, self-driving cars, security management, emergency management. Uh, AI technologies may not be today governable by this existing regulatory framework. So this regulatory framework needs to evolve, and it's going to be a very hard set of questions to answer to uh, in order to support AI development. And it's a regulatory framework that cannot be static, will always be very dynamic. So in these specific sessions, the innovators will discuss and generate ideas about how governments can take advantage of AI. That's session number one. Session number two is about big data, which obviously is the flow, it's the blood of the artificial intelligence. The question that we posed is, from regulation to active management, how can a more proactive approach to big data lead to smarter countries? Uh, obviously, and I'm saying something is very well known, big data represents the fuel, data represents the fuel of tomorrow's production and a critical feed on information to AI-based services. In these sessions, the innovators will be asked to discuss how a more proactive approach to big data could help tackle social and productive challenges in the ways that magnify the effects on people's well-being and business competitiveness. And again, how can governments make the life of citizens and businesses, and therefore of the development, better by mastering the technology that generates AI? There is one common issue across all governments, which is government big data is usually stored in silos. This is not an Italian problem, this is not a European problem, this is a government problem in general. We need to find ways to leverage points to convince the gatekeepers of those silos to collaborate. Should, for example, governments build, and this is a very intriguing question, national framework to manage data as a necessary step to build the so-called government as an API? Furthermore, once again, big data may not be governable or governed by the current policy framework, regulatory framework, and it presents a unique policy challenge. This is the second set. The third one is the changing nature of society, alias the future of work. How could innovation help deal upcoming social and demographic changes? So the underlying point of this question is how do we change the narrative, or how do we focus on a different narrative, which is way too much focus on the negative effects of technology and jobs and employment. As ever, innovation is destroying all jobs while creating new ones. Let's focus on the new one creation of jobs. That's the objective of this, without obviously ignoring the negative effects, but let's focus on how positive the spin can be given um, to the effects of the new technologies. In the sessions, innovators will highlight how new technologies are shaping the future world of labor, identify those skills which will be more in demand, thus helping workers reap the benefits of change. Um, at the end of the day, I will be asked to come to the closing session of the multi-stakeholder conference to present the summary of the work that those 40 innovators from all over the G7 countries have come to Turin to discuss and present to policymakers our opinions. Thank you.
Joran Marbi, CEO and President of ICANN, is invited to take the floor. Thank you. I always appreciate when I get applause before I speak. Uh, first, I'm going to share a little bit of what ICANN is. Um, ICANN is a technical, non-for-profit organization. We are not the internet, but we are an essential part, together with our sister organizations, to provide what is called internet today. In simple terms, you can say with a telephone book of internet. We make sure that end users can reach a web page instead of using an IP number. And that may seem like a small task, but we have a gigantic, gigantic telephone book. We are really used because internet is not one single network. Internets are thousands of different networks. And when one user on one network, when it reads a user on another network, that's where ICANN is used. The funny thing is that last week I had the pleasure of meeting a gentleman called Kleinrock. Most of you have probably not heard about him. Together with some other people called Windsurf, uh, Steve Crocker and other ones, they actually invented this thing called the internet. And it's not a long time ago. We're talking about 20, 25 years ago. And when I asked them what were their intentions with the internet and uh, how we fulfill their sort of promise, they all say we work according to plan. The thing is that nobody could, nobody could anticipate the way we see the internet today. Internet today is much more than a technical solution. Internet today is something that reaches all parts of our life. Education, business, some gossip, and also our love lives. That's why ICANN is one of the first organizations that uses a multi-stakeholder model. The multi-stakeholder model for us is to make sure that everybody can have their voice heard. We have everything from academia, businesses, governments, end users representing ICANN. And the reason for that is that no one can speak for all users of internet because we all use internet very, very differently. Internet is unique for its users and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so successful. It's also important to do that to make sure that no one can hide hijack the functions we're providing for the end users of the world. But we're also part of a much bigger ecosystem. You have everything from ISPs, telcos, governments with spectrum, manufacturers of equipment, everybody who plays content on the internet. We're all part of the same ecosystem. And that's really what makes internet so unique. There is no central point of the internet. There is no off switch of the internet. Internet is represented by the three and a half billion users connected to one system. There is no control over the internet. And when that also creates a problem. I know that the UN system talks about a billion, one and a half billion more users uh, in the next five to 10 years. Most of them is going to be mobile. Most of them will not even have using English as a context. Most of them will come from countries in Africa, Asia, and South America. For up to the users we have now have often been the elite. The users can afford to have access to internet. Who knows how the system works? I think that the next generation internet users will be very different. That also creates a challenge for us. We have a global system, but now we have to build it with local. Because the end users of tomorrow will demand more local information in local languages. In ICANN we work a lot with that, but we also see that we have to work together with everybody to provide those services. But there are also threats. I know that you are going to discuss those things as well. Hate, speech, cybercrime, cybersecurity are all things that are there. But I also want you to not forget all the positive things with internet. Because one of the things that we see right now is what we call the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There are many legislative, pro legislative proposals around the world right now who can actually break the interconnectivity of internet going forward. And we have to make sure to work together so that doesn't happen. We have all benefited from one connected system. 
There is a lot of people who now have much more information than they had before. They have the ability for education for businesses. That's built on interconnectivity and nothing else. And we need to work together to make sure that we don't end up where we localize internet to that point that we don't have a global system anymore. There is no denial that we have problems. But the internet has been successful because we have found ways and methods to work together. That is the important thing. We every day are challenged with things that no one has seen before because there has been no internet before. A lot of the things we see and a lot of the problems we see is because of the internet, yes. But it's also because we have now have end users in almost every corner of the world when we've never seen those challenges before. I think this conference is very important. I think the discussions here are very important because we have to find ways to preserve what is good and methods for solutions in the future. We've done that before in the internet community. We have to broaden that discussion and I'm very happy to see initiatives like this where we broaden it. And I want to end to quote one of our sister organizations, ISOP, who has a tagline which I really love. We're all in this together. Thank you very much. Andrew Wickoff, Director for Science, Technology and Innovation, OECD, is invited to take the floor. Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here this morning. Uh, I welcome meetings such as these, in particular the two, three previous speakers have set me up. We're in a time of fantastic change, and with it, I think everyone would agree in this room, the governments need to improve their awareness of the digital transformation that's upon us, where the pace of change has really uh, been, been breathtaking, as many have said. We all carry around circa 1992 supercomputers in our pockets. We've seen they're 24-7 connected across the G7. We have 90% of people with high-speed broadband connections. And with it comes new challenges such as automation that are going through our various industries and confront a reality where 40% of the workforce now across the OECD countries only has mid-level capability of dealing with problem-solving, technology-rich environments. That number drops to 15% if you're over 55, where I see that's not really the case in this room. Um, and it's a technology change that's, that's driving this. We need to plan for an era, as Diego says, where AI becomes pervasive. Now, the digital transformation has some unique economic opportunities, which is what uh, we study at the OECD. This is not going to be business as usual going forward. We're in the midst of looking at eight of these different properties right now. I just want to look at one of them this morning. It's what we call scale without mass, a term I attribute to Eric Brynjolfsson in 2008. Very simply, it's the ability to scale up to serve billions of customers around the globe with a relatively low marginal cost. It begins to beg the question, what is a small business in 2017? Um, this is in sharp contrast to the archetype industry on which I think many of our public policies are based. The auto industry, which kind of defined 1980s and 1990s economies in many ways, and just to use an example from the United States, what I call the big three firms, required significant scale. I mean, employees, plants, scattered around the globe to serve what were about 10 million customers amongst the three of them. In doing so, they had to put a footprint around the globe and by doing so, be subject to the sovereign laws and policies in the countries where they operate. Now, in contrast, the top three tech firms in the United States had roughly the same revenue, and actually this is old data for those of you, but a much larger market cap, almost a factor of 30, but the employees were almost an order of magnitude fewer, less. But they still have products that are used around the world, but 
With this reach, it does not result in much of an international physical presence. Now, I know what many of you are thinking. This has got a lot to do with taxation, which is high on the agenda. And in fact, that's true, but it has to do with many other policies that will be affected by this. Think about trade policy. Um, scale without mass enables e-entrepreneurs, like those who operate on eBay, to be born global, which vastly expands the markets for SMEs and gives SMEs a great opportunity if they can, in fact, seize upon it. Scale without mass will lead to new growth dynamics. Uh, with those firms who get it, may vastly outperform, outperform the rest. Uh, our research shown here shows, in fact, this is the case. So-called frontier firms vastly outpacing others in the sector. Uh, many, many of these laggards are, in fact, unfortunately, SMEs. And it's true for services generally on the right, but it's especially true for what are called ICT services on the left. In both cases, worryingly, the gap is growing over time. So let me pause for a second and just put on the table, I think, three broad-based implications for policymaking. One, as people have said before me, we need to rethink many of our policies and make sure that they're suitable for the digital era. Two, it can't just be identifying a narrow sector. This needs to be broad-based across the economy and require a whole government view. And third, now is the window of opportunity during this transitory uh, period. We need to be proactive in the policy world instead of being reactive. Now, the next production revolution is to the OECD at least a confluence of technologies. Everything from robotics to big data to new materials. But at the heart of it, the common element is data which allows these technologies to be combined. And it's this combinatorial capability that I think is truly revolutionary and begins to form what others have called an ecosystem, complete with feedback loops, which will lead to further innovations we can't even think of. Now, all these technologies are flowing into our manufacturing and service sectors, which will be transformed by data flows and their analysis. This will change what I call the topography, the mapping of global value chains, as it has for this Phillips shaver that used to be completely made in China and now is back and dropped in Netherlands. While back on Dutch soil, it has very few employees, thanks to almost complete automation. Now, data is also changing capital investment we at the OECD look at capital investment as a driver of innovation and productivity, but, but the nature of investment is changing, both in the aeronautics sector, in the farming sector, and in the computing sector. As data is enabling the conversion of this capital equipment from investments that you could depreciate over years and years to what are now services and current expenditures, where you buy computing by the drink as they say. Now this has implications for public incentives designed to encourage investment as well as government statistics on investment and productivity. It also has implications for trade policy as well. 3D printing will mean we'll be shipping fewer goods across borders but exchanging more designs and in intellectual property. This will alter the composition of trade but heighten the importance of intellectual property rights and their protection and enforcement. And with this comes yet again another new role for the internet, and that is as a sea lane uh, for trade. This reinforces the need for an open internet, just like we have the need for open seas, and the need for extreme care to be exercised when placing rules on the movement of data. Lastly, as we just heard, the origin of the internet is as an open system where it's a key factor to his success over time. This needs to be preserved, but it makes it susceptible to security failures and breaches and SMEs, many of whom lack the resources, both in terms of finances, but especially in terms of talent, are especially vulnerable. 
and this figure shows they're increasingly the subject of attacks. Let me end with a list of some of the priorities. We see it that I love to see discussed throughout the course of the day. I encourage all of you, this cannot just be a government-led effort. It must be in the interest of the Internet, continue to be a multi-stakeholder-led initiative. Thank you very much for your attention.